was we really where we ended off yesterday was to look at full factorial systems. And all the material we're going to see from today's class onwards really takes that basic full factorial experiment and takes it out a step now. So now in today's class we're going to introduce the term model with blocking and confounding and half fractions. The reason for these is because if you ever have to do a full factorial, you'll find that for most systems, the full factorial is going to be impossible. You're going to run out of budget and you're going to run out of time before you can do the full factorial. And there's many practical aspects of implementing the experiment in a full factorial manner, which make it really tough to implement in that form that's required. So everything we're going to see from today's class and the next two, three classes really focuses on the practical side of the experimentation. And how do we adjust our analysis to account for, for all of that? The first thing that you face when you do with an experiment are the factors that are beyond your control, but you know they might influence your process, or you're not even sure if they influence your process or not. So how do you deal with those? Well, let's call them disturbances. And ideally, you're able to control all the possible disturbances that will affect your wire. So if we're in fact, when you look at the start of the course, we're only changing one variable at a time. We were comparing situation A versus situation B. We kept everything else constant. Sometimes we're just not able to keep everything constant. So what do we do about those? Well, we say that when we're not able to keep our other variables constant, they're either unknown, we don't know that they may have an impact on Y, or we're not able to measure their impact on Y, or we just they're beyond our control. So, for example, I can't control the temperature outside, but if the temperature has an effect on my process, it's going to affect Y. Well, the re when we face with those situations, we have to randomize our experiments. And at the start of the course, uh, sorry, at the start of the section, I uh, skipped over a few slides, right back at page uh, 11 in the slides. And I had this question up here, why it's important to randomize experiments. Well, the main reason we written up there was to prevent these unmeasurable and uncontrollable disturbances from affecting the variable Y. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's uh, first part of the class. The reason for randomizing experiments is to account for this Disturbances, but also there's another reason. If we randomize, we generate independent data, and if we generate independent data, we can then go and use statistical tools like the t-test to analyze our results. And I give this example in the course textbook on a practical application. Fisher in the early 1900s had an experiment where he could prove to, or he had a slave in a claim that you could test whether you added the milk first to the tea or after. So there was a nice experiment that he showed to prove that statistical reliability of that lady's ability. Well, a more practical example for our case today is if you're considering Coke versus Pepsi, it's someone who claims they can tell the difference. Or an engineering example is where we look at those two reactors, TK104 and 107. So I give a little bit of a derivation in the course textbook. I won't go through it here. It's about a page long that proves that as long as we run our experiments in a random fashion, we can then analyze those data using a t-test, which is what we did earlier on. So here I, I prove in these next few slides is that even if we didn't know about the t-test and we only knew simply about randomization, we would get the identical results as the t-test. That's really, really powerful statement. Uh, so I go through that derivation in the course notes, um, in the course textbook, and here in the slides there's a bit of a derivation. But I looked at the example in the slides from a very simplified point of view, between eight data points and nine data points. The original case study had 20 and 23. And the reason is, for eight versus nine, I can do the calculations on a computer. But for a real data set, and even 20 versus 23 is a pretty small data set by today's standards. If I had to follow a completely randomized analysis, I would have 960,000 960, million combinations to work with. It would take about three years just to do that data analysis. Okay. But we have the t-test available to us, and the t-test will give you the exact results of this guy 
only if I randomize the order of my experiments. <coughs> so randomization is critical. It's what allows us then to go use tools like t-tests afterwards. So let's go back then to this discussion over here on disturbances and why we need to randomize. So I'll show you a crude simple, simple, simple example that demonstrates the need for randomization. But one thing that's helpful is I posted on the course website yesterday that there's this updated slide. So if you've been checking the announcements on the website before then you would have seen this. Or just we'll take this down now as we go through it. We can consider all the factors in our process, all the variables, as we're going into one of these four categories. So when I asked you in your course project to list all the possible variables you could think about that could affect why. You, many of you sent me emails where you had seven or eight different variables. Now let's take a look at classifying those variables. Either those me variables are measurable, yes or no, or they're controllable, yes or no. And because we're dealing with DOEs, let's look at it in the DOE factorial table as well. So if the variable is measurable and it is controllable, that's a factor that can go into your experiment. So let, me, let me do this by an example. Imagine my experiment is to test the gas mileage of my car. So some of the factors that I might, or some of the variables I might consider would be tire pressure. Low tire pressure versus high tire pressure. And then I ride my car around on a fixed highway route, and I can then measure the gas mileage. I can control my tire pressure, and I can measure it. That's a factor in my experiment. The air conditioner, I can choose to ride around with the air conditioner on or off. It's controllable and it's measurable. I can choose to drive around with my windows open or closed. That's controllable and it's measurable. Let's take a look at what a covariate is. This is a variable that is measurable, but I have no control on it or control over it. So a good example of that is ambient temperature. As many cases, that's a, a, a good example of a covariate. So ambient temperature, I cannot control the temperature outside. It is what it is on the day that I'm doing my experiments. But I certainly can measure it. So what I need to do is, in those cases, I must record that data as a covariate. So if I have a table, I have factor A, that might be tire pressure. B might be air conditioner on or off and C might be windows open or closed. So windows, AC, and tire pressure. And in my full factorial, I have those three factors. I've got this as minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus. The AC factor would be minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus. The windows open, minus, 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 plus, 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 plus. That's standard order for that, for that gas mileage experiment. What I'm saying to you for covariance is add a column to your table and record your covariance in an additional column. And I may have two or three covariates that I'm, I've got for. So the covariance of temperature, I would then record the temperature when I'm running experiment one, then I may choose to run experiment four, then the next experiment might be six, then back to two again, then three, then I run eight, and then I run seven in that random order. So I record seven temp eight me temperature measurements as I'm doing my experiments. Now let's say that, that later on I go and analyze my gas mileage data, and I find that there's something in my data that sticks out as unusual. I can't explain something. Well, it might just be that one of those covariates I recorded is the thing that is affecting Y. Okay, so in a, good, a nice example of that was a few years ago, I was co-supervising a student at PepsiCo, Quaker Foods, and I had her record all possible things in addition to the variables from her experiments. And it was later on that, that actually we found something interesting in one of those covariates that affected Y. The problem is if she hadn't recorded those data on the day, we would never have figured out what that problem was. Okay, so covariates are things you can measure, but you have no control over. So this might be the operator who's running your experiment would be a good example of a covariate. 
You have to take whichever operators assigned to the shift that you're running the experiment that day. They're going to do the work, but record that information. You may find afterwards that that has an effect. If you never recorded it, you would never know. If I was doing this gas mileage example, I would record a sum like compared to the amount of traffic that I felt on the highway, or the average speed I was riding at over the experiment. Maybe that's a variable that I, I can't control my average speed, I have to go with the normal traffic, but I can certainly record it on my GPS, add it to my data table afterwards, and it might be a factor that's, that's play a role. Let's take a look at the next one. Disturbances which are neither controllable nor measurable. So an example of that might be in this instance, my oil that's deteriorating in my vehicle, or the engine is deteriorating over the, the, the 20, 30 days that I'm doing this experiment. Okay. I can't measure the deterioration of my car's performance, or the oil, or the, or the engine deterioration. I can't control it either. Okay. I'm not going to take my car in for a service, do an experiment, take my car in for a service, do an experiment, take my car in for an experiment, right? So and if my car is deteriorating over time as I do these experiments, it's a disturbance that's neither controllable nor measurable. Okay. So if I come back to this table, what if I had done my experiments in exactly standard order? I followed my experiments in this order shown on the table over here. The problem that would show up then later on is that let's say I could in some way quantify the effect of the deteriorating oil quality on the gas mileage. So if I've just gone for an oil replacement, I may get good gas mileage, but then over time my gas mileage decreases linearly or in some way. I don't know. If I had done my experiments in the order of the table, I would have done all the four experiments with my windows open first and then the four experiments with my windows closed afterwards, or closed open, whichever way I assign minus and plus. Let's say, for example, factor C has no effect on gas mileage, but deteriorating oil quality does. I just can't measure it. That's why it's over here in this quadrant. I would then determine that Windows, in fact, has a significant effect on gas mileage. But it's not due to Windows, it's because of this variable here. Because I've done my experiments in the order of, of the standard table. So by doing experiments in standard order, you're risking confusing another factor that's changing over time that you can't measure, that you can't control. So you're risking confusing a disturbance that's impacting your process with one of your factors. That's why it's so critical to take your standard order table after you've designed it and randomly run the experiments. And so even though this is experiment one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in, ran in standard order, take those eight numbers, put them on a deck of cards and draw them randomly out of a hat and run the experiments in that order. Okay, or on pieces of paper. Some way of picking a, a totally random order if you do not do that, you risk confounding, so this is a new word we'll introduce, you risk confounding the disturbance effect with one of the factors in your table. So when we say confounding, we mean confusing. You risk confusing a disturbance, the oil quality, with a factor in your experiment. Windows. So I'm, I, I would get that Windows effect showing up as being significant when really it's not the Windows causing the problem, it's the oil policy causing the problem. Okay, so in this instance, your only recourse to dealing with that disturbance is to randomize the order of your experiments. That's the only thing you can do about it. Covariance, the only thing you can do about it is to record your data and analyze it afterwards and see that it affects you. So regress your y variable onto the covariate and see if there's a significant coefficient. Fact is, these are the things that you change in the model. The last one is variables that are controllable. I can change them, but I do not know by how much they affect y. And for those variables, we use blocking. Blocking is nothing more 
than a fancy word to say pairing. So we looked at pairing earlier on for the univariate case. When we're dealing with multiple variables, we change that name up in the order of blocking. So let me, let me take a look then at blocking in the next few slides. So blocking then is a disturbance that is not controllable, uh, sorry, that is not measurable. It's not measurable, but it is controllable. So a classic example of this is for those of you that are doing uh, baking experiments, you have enough material in your batch but only to do a certain number of runs. Or in a chemical plant, we have only enough raw material to do four experiments. But I've got three factors in my experiment, so I need to do eight experiments. I've only got enough material though for four runs. So that's okay. I use one batch of materials for the, for the first four runs and another batch of material for the second four runs. But what if that batch of materials has an effect on why I don't, I'm not able to measure it, I am able to control it. My, choice, my ability to choose the batch of raw materials that I'm using is my control here. I can choose to control it. I'm just not able to measure what that raw material's effect is of why. Raw material is not a factor that I'm investigating. I'm not interested in, in investigating the raw material. Because in the future I have to use whatever raw material I'm getting from my supplier anyway. So raw material is not a factor. I can't set it raw material to A versus B or low versus high. Right? Because I don't have that ability. It's not a variable of interest. But it can definitely affect Y. So we want to choose our experiments so we, we minimize that effect. Okay, so coming back to this example here, the last thing you'll do or should do is run your first four experiments on raw material one and then the next four experiments on raw material two. That's definitely a no-no because then you're going to risk confounding the C factor, which is four minuses and then four pluses with that raw material effect. So that's definitely one way of not allocating the four batch of the raw material. So how should we do it instead? Well, here's how we do it. We intentionally confound, confuse our raw material selection with the ABC interaction. So remember last class we said that three-factor interaction, ABC, in most engineering systems is almost never going to be significant to us. In most practical situations, that ABC interaction is never going to be important. Well, let me sacrifice the ABC interaction. Let me say that, well, rather than trying to estimate the ABC interaction, let me assign my raw material selection on that ABC variable. So if I write out my full factorial in A, B, and C, I can calculate the two-factor interaction sign, but I can also calculate the three-factor interaction sign. So for the A, B, C factor, that's minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus. So now it says that I need to be found with this three-factor interaction. What I will go do is I will run all the minuses, those four minuses, I will run those four experiments on batch one, and then I will run the four pluses on batch two. So I have to allocate two batches of raw materials, raw material batch one and raw material batch two. Each batch of raw materials can run four experiments. I have to assign those batches to four experiments, and then batch two gets assigned to another four experiments. The best way of assigning those batches is to assign it according to the sign of the ABC column. I'd say one example, one way of definitely not doing it is assigning it to match the signs of the C column. So we do not run these four experiments with batch one and these four experiments with batch two. This is so tempting to do. Many people end up doing this, right? They say, well, I'm just going to run the first four rows of my standard order table raw material one and then the next four experiments from the last four rows of the standard table. If you do that, at the end, you're not going to know if it's factor C that has an effect on your Y or if it's the raw material that has an effect on your Y. That's why you don't do it that way. 
the we saying now, well, we don't really care about the ABC interaction. I don't really care if that's significant or not, because in most situations, that really is almost never significant. Well, in that case, then, I'm then not interested in estimating ABC. Let me go assign the batches according to the signs of the ABC. Okay, so, so that uh, that's the reasoning behind it. We must still go and run our experiments though in random order after that. You don't then go run experiment one, then experiment four, then experiment six, seven, and then go run two, three, five, and eight. And that's hard in a, in a company. Because in a company, they've got a batch of raw material there. They're going to tell you, run the experiments on that batch of raw material. Then you can go switch over to the other batch. Okay? You have to say, no, in order to keep this experimental data correct and, and independent of each other, I have to randomly select batches. So coming back to that summer student I supervised a year or two ago, she was processing oats, and the oats is available in a big silo, and you have to process it in the order that the oats is being <coughs> fed into the process. We had to work around their schedule and reorganize our experiments so that we could run them in the random order. And it ended up taking us two months to do these eight experiments because we had to pick our times to match the batches of raw materials that she had available. Okay, so sometimes, Enforcing that randomization is tough and costly. It means that you have to have some sort of delay in the process. But you have to be aware of it ahead of time. Let's see why this works now. Okay? And let's first visualize it and then we'll see how, why it works. When we're blocking, what we end up doing is I've chosen those batches with the closed circles to be batch one and the open batches, open circles to be batch two. Notice the interesting pattern on the cube. There's this diagonal on every face between the closed points and the open points. Okay, so that's intentional, this diagonal structure. And we're going to see why in a minute. Let's take a look at an algebraic way. Let's assume here are my responses that I record after the experiment is done. And I'll put a little tilde on top of the y's that correspond to batch 1. And I'll put a circle on top of the y's corresponding to batch 2. So what I mean by that is let's assume that raw material actually does have an effect on Y. We don't know it, it's not measurable, but let's assume it has some quantifiable effect, or not quantifiable, but it has a, an effect on Y by an amount of G units. We don't know what G is. So the actual Y that I that the that the ABC factors have then gets augmented by this additional factor G, or this additional amount of G, due to the batch. So I'll record that as Y tilde. And Y, y dot, I record the actual Y plus H. This is, H is the amount that's affected on Y due to producing the second batch of raw materials. <coughs> Notice then that when we calculate our effects, so for example, if I had to calculate the slope coefficient for factor A, it's minus y1 plus y2 minus y3 plus y4 minus plus minus plus. Okay, so we're comfortable with, with doing that. Very interesting what happens here is that these g's and h's end up canceling out. So even if the raw material does have an effect on y by an amount g for batch 1 and by an amount h for batch 2, if you look at expanding that out, the G's and H's will cancel. And what you'll end up estimating is the pure effect of A. The raw materials will not have an effect on A. And that holds for B, C, A, B, B, C, and A, C. So let's think back to pairing. When we looked at pairing in the univariate case, we said we always run pairing when we're trying to do an experiment on a process, but there's something in common between my pairs. Well, here's the same thing. The thing in common between my pairs is this effect G. I've got my raw material that's affecting my process. And we did pairing so that that commonality cancels out. Here we're seeing the same thing. It just happens over multiple experiments. So pairing was in the, in the univariate case, it was always between two levels, low and high. Well, here it's the same thing, it's just happening over, over all the experiments, but there's still cancellation. So, 
blocking and confounding extremely important when you've got these situations, and this is a practical situation, it happens so many times that you've got a limited amount of material and you need to split, split your batches up. We always choose to confound on the ABC interaction. Or if I was running four factors, I would choose to confound on the ABCD interaction. So I choose the interaction that's least likely to be significant. Another way you can visualize this, if you want to get another way to visualize this, is, is mathematically. If we look back at my X matrix, I can consider that this raw material is as if it is a new factor D, capital D, that I add to my experiment. And if I've got it confounded on the ABC, it means that my D factor is minus plus minus plus, depending on whether I use batch 1 or batch 2. So batch 1's I would assign a minus, batch 2's I assign a plus. Now notice what's going on here in this X matrix. These two columns are identical. So those two columns are identical. It means that when we estimate the effect of ABC in R or whatever software you use, you're not estimating the effect of ABC alone. You're estimating the effect of ABC plus that raw material. This is important because if I go and do my analysis and I find that ABC slope coefficient to be significant, most likely it's because the raw material actually has an effect on the, on the process. It's probably not going to be the ABC interaction. So if I find the slope coefficient for the ABC three factor interaction is, is large and the confidence interval does not span zero, well, it could either be the ABC and interaction really is significant, or it's due to the raw materials. I can't tell. That's what confounding means. I cannot tell. It's blended up, it's confounded or mixed up as one. I cannot ever separate this. The only way I can separate it is to go run the experiments with different raw materials and then really judge whether it's the raw material that has an effect or if it's the ABC interaction. Okay, but most instances, we recognize that this is unlikely to be significant, and it's going to be the raw materials. So that's blocking and confounding. Now the next section on fractional factorials is going to look identical to that. The geometry and the analysis is going to look identical to it. So we're going to see exactly the same picture in a minute, but it's for a different reason we're going to see the same picture. The reason is, let's introduce this by an example. If we had a full factorial in many factors, I said at the start of the class that in most cases that leads to experiments that are unmanageable. You will run out of a budget before you get to finish your experiments. So here's, a, here's an example of, of a typical process where the company is investigating factors related to their cell culture. And they've got those five factors over there. Dissolved oxygen, agitation, pH, substrate type A versus B. And then this first factor here is an interesting one. The factor says either I run with a, a fast initial ramp in temperature and then I go constant or I use a slowly increasing ramp in temperature over time all the way to the end of the batch. Okay, so they choose to run their batch in two different ways. Either one way where they ramp up really quickly and then go flat line in temperature, or they just go a slow increase in temperature over the duration of the batch. Now each batch is 10 days. So one experiment takes 10 days. 32 experiments in a 2 to the 5 factorial, that's 320 days. It's a whole year that elapses about before they even get to analyze their data. This company is going to give up on full factorials. Okay, so also those of you that are doing experiments where you've investigated four or five factors, you're not going to be able to do your experiments in a weekend. Okay, you have, you're going to be forced into doing a, a fractional factorial. We cannot run full factorials in both situations. Okay, and the reason is. People are, well, what people are tempted as to do here is to say, well, okay, full factorials are great and all, but I'm not able to estimate or, or work with five factors. So then what they go do is they go say, well, let's have a meeting with our scientists and engineers 
and they go start to delete factors out there. They say, well, I don't think pH has an effect. And then the next guy says, well, agitation rate shouldn't have an effect. Let's take that out. Then you're ending up with the two to the three factorial, eight experiments, 80 days. Okay, that's doable. But you forgot, you don't know. At the back of your mind, you will never know that whether pH or agitation rate really has an effect. So you lose out. Well, what can we do about it? We will recognize the following then. So the insight in a fractional factorial system is the following key point. A 2 to the 5 factorial is done so that we get 32 experiments, 32 data points, so that we can go estimate 32 slope coefficients and the intercept. Do we really need 32 slope coefficients? Do I need that A, B, C, D interaction? Do I need the A, B, C, D, E? Five factor interaction, do I need the ABC three factor interaction, BCD, CD? All those high level interactions likely are going to be small anyway. So spending 32 runs to find out something that is going to be obvious in hindsight is a waste of time. So all these high level interactions are not going to be significant for most situations. Really what we will probably only find is our main effects and the two-factor interactions for these models. So the main effects are A, B, C, D, D. The two-factor interactions are A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, B, C, B, C. You can add them up to get about 16. Okay, so really only 16 of those 32 slope coefficients are going to be useful to you. So we can definitely say, I don't need 32 runs, because I don't want to estimate 32 slope coefficients. Well, how many runs do I need? And how many can I get away with? Well, the first, first approach is to simply do half the number of runs. And we do that, and we call it a half fraction. So a half fraction is, instead of estimating a 2 to the k number of experiments, we have half times 2 to the k or 2 to the k minus 1 factorial. So let's take a look at what we lose out. What do we sacrifice, right? Because we're definitely going to lose something. We're not going to be able to get our full factorials results by only doing half the amount of work. So nature doesn't allow that for us. We're going to have to give up something in order to get this cheaper experiment done in a short amount of time. Okay, now one thing that you can do, just for those of you that are thinking about your experiments, in a company in this situation where they had to run 32 runs, obviously if they had two reactors, they could run two in parallel. Okay? They used it. So for some of you, that is a possibility. But for many companies, that is not. This might be the only reactor that they have. They're definitely not going to sacrifice it for a whole year to be available for this experiment. system. So sometimes we can run our experiments in parallel when we cannot. That forces us even more into running a fraction factorial. So let's take a look here. We've got eight experiments that we should have done. So these are the eight up here on the board. A, B, C run in the usual standard order. Then I've written out the A, B, A, C, B, C, and the A, B, C interactions. If we want to do half the number of experiments, I only want to do four of those eight. Which are the four that I pick? same sign on a fact on an interaction that we don't expect to be significant. That might be one, one approach. Okay, so we've done in like in the blocking example where we have picked ABC as the variable that I choose to confound on. One of the things I can do here in a in a half fraction is to pick four experiments that lead me to still estimate my main effects, but then estimate my two or three factor interaction falls away. Okay, so one, one way we can do this is to run our experiments, only pick the four where ABC is all minus. So pick this one, row one, row four, 
row 6 and row 7. So if I pick only those four experiments, ABC is minus, 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 minus for all four experiments. It means that I'm not able to estimate the ABC interaction. I could just as well pick the four experiments with ABC equal to plus. So I pick rows 2, 3, 5, and 8. Again, because ABC is all positive for those four runs, I'm not able to estimate the ABC. So if we look at a half fraction then, geometrically, if I follow that strategy, I'm either going to run the open circles or closed circles. So that had to be really the correct how to pull those circles open or closed. <laughs> so so all the, either the open circles are run or the closed circles are run. It doesn't matter which four you pick, as long as you pick either one or the other set. So let's say I picked the closed circles for now. So notice that the geometry of this diagram is exactly the same as we saw in the previous confounding example. So that's not not a coincidence. But let's take a look at what happens. If I pick those four experiments, the closed runs, and I go and find out afterwards that, let's say, for example, the C effect going backwards and forwards into the board is not significant. So in other words, the C effect really has no impact on Y. In other words, this direction in and out of the board can be collapsed forward onto one face. What I end up with then is a full factorial in an A factor and a B factor. Remember, I've only done four experiments. Okay, so a full factorial in four experiments means I can estimate two factors and the interaction and the slope coefficient. So A, B, A, B, and the intercept. So if afterwards I find the C factor has no effect, Automatically, I already have the four experiments as if A and B were significant. And if we were, I can go show that again. Let's say the A factor is not significant. So this direction back here in this original cube in the left to right direction is not significant. Again, that collapses so that I get a full factorial in B and C. So I don't do any additional work. I do my four experiments and I find afterwards that the A factor is not important, that it has no impact on Y. So it means I can delete A from the model. That means my original experiment is only in terms of B and C. I recover a full factorial from the fractional factorial that is a full factorial in the two factors that really are significant. And again, I can go do this for the AC. Let's say I find this up and down direction B is not significant. This open, this closed circle and that closed circle collapses up to there. This closed circle at this point and that point collapses up. And I get the full factorial in the A and C factors. B is not significant. So this is true of fractional factorials of all types. There's a very special reason why they're chosen in the way I chose them. So when I chose those A, B, to confound on the A, B, C interaction in the table up here, I chose to run the four experiments with all at minus, and the, or I choose to run all the four experiments at plus. Either choice, it doesn't matter which choice I make. Afterwards, I will find that should a variable be insignificant, my fractional factorial will automatically collapse to a full factorial. I don't have to go do any additional work. This is why fractional factorials should always be used. You have a limited budget to do experiments. So companies say, well, I've got a budget for only eight experiments. So what the first thing they go do is say, well, I can go do a two to the three factorial. I can only go vary three factors. No, definitely not. You could go vary four factors. That's a two to the four factorial, 16 experiments, but do a half fraction. That's eight experiments. So let's take a look at that. If you have a budget only for eight experiments, the temptation is to say, I can only do 
Well, I can only go and investigate three factors. Well, that's not true. You can go and investigate 2 to the 4 minus 1. You can go and investigate four factors in a half fraction. Or in other words, you can go do a 2 to the 4 factorial and do a half fraction and still do eight experiments. Okay, but you can now go and investigate a fourth factor using the same budget. You've not done any additional work, not taken any longer than you would have otherwise, but you've investigated an additional variable that you would not have otherwise been able to do. So, all of you that have emailed me with six, seven factors in your experiments, you've probably all seen my response to you as being, investigate all those variables, but do a fractional factorial. This is how you go set it up. So rather than saying, well, I've only got time on the weekend to do eight experiments, so I can only go investigate three factors, rather go investigate four factors in a half fraction. You may find one or two of those factors are insignificant and your fractional factorial will collapse to a full factorial afterwards. So, how did I find, in this example it was easy to see geometrically why I chose ABC as my sign to, uh, to choose my experiments. For higher number of experiments, it's not so trivial, and so we have to resort to a table that tells us how to do that. This table is called the, the trade-off table, I don't think that's my name for it. But what it tells you is how to run your experiments. So we looked at this example here. This was an example of eight experiments, I only ran four afterwards. So let's go see where that is on this table. I only ran four experiments. So number of runs is my vertical axis. I only ran four experiments. So I'm in this top row. Well, this top row, the only square that's available to you is the first one. So it's the simplest example of a fractional factorial. The number of factors we're investigating is three. We investigated three factors. I only ran four experiments though. So usually three factors, for the entire eight experiments, I only ran four. How did I find to run the experiments where ABC was positive or ABC was negative? That's what this little guy is telling me down here in this corner. It's telling me how to set up my experiment. Okay, so let's take a look. It's telling me create a full factorial in A and B and assign variable C as the product of A and B. Let's take a look at that. So, so this table is always read in this manner where you use the horizontal, the vertical axis is your budget. Your boss says you can only run this number of experiments. That forces you into a particular row. So if I can only run four experiments, I'm forced into this first row. It's telling me the largest number of factors I can go investigate with four experiments is three. If I had budget for eight experiments, very, very cool piece of information here. If I have a budget only for eight experiments, the maximum number of factors I can go investigate is seven. That's tremendous. I can go investigate the effect of seven variables in only eight experiments. We're going to see that next week. But that's how you use this table. I can go investigate the effect of three, four, five, six, or seven factors in only eight experiments. So this vertical axis is your budget available to you. Once that is fixed, then you move left or right. So let's take a look at the simplest example. I've only got a budget for four experiments. I can, run, um, I can measure three factors. How to interpret this bottom right-hand piece of information down here this is, is quite simple. It says, go write a full factorial in terms of A and B. Okay, so to the left, to the right of that equal sign is an A and B. It's telling me go write a full factorial in A and B. Well, a full factorial in A and B is minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus. So those are my four experiments I'm going to write. So one, two, three, four. 
Then it says, go assign factor C as the product of A and B. So set variable C equal to the product of A and B. Minus times minus in the first row gets me plus. Plus times minus gets me a minus. Minus times plus gets me a minus. Plus times plus gets me a plus. There's my four experiments. Quick and easy. So setting up your fractional factorial, trivial. You guys can all go do it over the weekend. So as long as you've figured out how many experiments you're willing to run and the time you're willing to set up for it, setting up what your, four, what your variables are and your factors are takes no, no time. You simply go use this table and you'll set C equal to the product of A and B. How does that compare to the, to the example I had given up here earlier? Let's go take a look. I said, let's go run the experiments where ABC was at minus. Well, that first row is minus, minus, minus. No, so, sorry. This example that I've written is ABC is at the positive. Okay, so we're, we're running the four experiments where ABC is at the plus. Okay, so plus, 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 plus. We're going to run rows 2, 3, row 5, and row 8. So that first experiment up here, minus, minus, plus, that corresponds to this row over here, minus, minus, plus. It corresponds to row 5 in the, in the full factorial. The second row, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, corresponds to row 2 from the full factorial. The third experiment, minus plus minus, minus plus minus, corresponds to row 3. And the last one will correspond to row 3. Okay. So I've selected those four rows from the full factorial table in that manner, using that algorithm. Okay. So you can always show that I could write out the full factorial and then go pick ABC and run my experiments, the four experiments at all at the pluses or all four at the minuses. Here I've chosen that the table has given to me the four experiments that are run at the plus signs of ABC. If I had gone and flipped the signs of C around, that's what the plus minus says there, I would have recovered the four runs of the other four runs of the table. So, We'll get to that technicality uh, next week. Well now, the simple way to, to use the table is to simply use the, the positives. So if I had to go set up a fractional factorial, you can go do this. Uh, this is for homework. I would recommend you do this. You want to investigate four factors. That would be 16 experiments normally. Go set your full factorial table in terms of A, B, and C. So that will get you eight runs, the full factorial in A, B, and C, and go set D, the sign of D equal to the product of A, B, and C. That will tell you how to run the eight experiments in a half fraction. Okay, so we're going to analyze that experiment next week. Okay, so there's a bit of discussion here on half fractions and some of the terminology. Here's what we've just said. We said go run. When we see C equals AB, it means go run factor A and B in the usual factorial way. Then, new, new terminology. We're going to generate factor C from the product of A and B. So this term generators, we're going to see that terminology coming up next. We're going to analyze next week the confounding pattern. What, what do we lose when we when we run a fractional factorial, right? So instead of running eight experiments, we're going to run four. Instead of being able to estimate eight, eight slow coefficients, I'm only going to be able to estimate four slow coefficients. So what, what am I going to lose out on? We're going to look at that next. So the class of Friday is canceled because of Kitchen. I will see you at the high ceremony and at Kitchen breakfast, and then next week we'll take this up.